the, uh, there's the queue in the distance, the uh, church bells of the village of Tomengos in central Portugal. This is Carl Munson on the Good Morning Portugal live stream for Happy Homesteaders. Uh, we're a YouTube channel and a podcast as well. Hope you're well today. Uh, yeah, hola, bon dia, tudo bem. And we will be delving further into the Portuguese language tomorrow. What a week this has been. Yesterday was a great show with um, Chris Paradox from One Trillion Trees. Today we see the welcome return because it's Thompson Tuesday of Will Thompson, that epidemiological super sleuth uh, who joins the dots. And uh, he's another deep delver into uh, the picture behind the picture with COVID-19, with coronavirus, and we'll be looking at how to build Im immunity. So um, as well as saying hi this morning, which I'm very grateful for, I uh, love you guys in the happy homesteaders community here. Um, why don't you say a little bit about what you're doing to build your health and immunity and sense of well-being as well. And we'll even have a look at the dictionary definition of immunity because a lot of these words get bandied around very freely and they you hear a word so often you kind of uh, take it to mean one thing and I think it's quite good to go back to its uh, etymological roots and have a look and see what it really means and just to give us a bit of a fresh perspective tomorrow then yes Portuguese language uh, we have a new partnership with Practice Portuguese on Thursday Dr Mick is here a new feature of the show um, it may it may become a, um, a more regular feature who knows but it'll be my pleasure to talk to Dr Mick and the idea on Thursday is to look at the collective trauma that we're going through um, I'm a touchy-feely kind of guy in that sort of respect uh, I don't think it should be underestimated that we are going through quite a traumatic situation collectively as a species um, in our societies in our communities and obviously with collective trauma comes individual response. So we'll be talking about both those things, the effect on the collective and what we can do uh, specifically individually uh, in the face of that as well. Talking to Dr. Mick, Mick Stevenson about that on Thursday. And then it's Fungi Friday. Uh, and uh, I think this is going to be a series of four connections with the Shimajito people. You know, I'm a big fan of Shimajito, the uh, urban farmers, the agri-tech guys in Fundao in Portugal and uh, hopefully talking to them on Friday the first of a series of four looking at urban farming and what you can do to grow mushrooms at home and start a little business growing mushrooms actually not a little business a big business potentially but just generally the ideas of uh, regeneration of urban farming of uh, technology coming into agriculture on a small scale local level and some really good stuff. The beauty of mushrooms I think mushrooms are incredible so fungi Friday so there's the week uh, that we're looking at and yes, nice one, Eloise. Hola, tudo bem to you. Um, uh, from Eloise in Panela and from Bridget, good morning to you. Uh, I don't know, I can't remember. Sorry, Bridget, I can't remember which part of Portugal or the world you're in. Do let us know and do let us know what you're doing to build your immunity and everyone else there who might be um, chomping down on a piece of toast uh, slathered with butter and jam. Uh, and I'm asking you what you're doing to build your immunity. A little of what you fancy does you good, obviously, but what else are you doing? What else are you doing on the heavy-duty health front? So let's have a look at uh, Georges Branco's um, report. Uh, you know how we like to start with facts and figures uh, and get the picture of what's going on with the coronavirus, with COVID-19, uh, state of play. So let's do that now. Thank you to George, who we spoke to last week, of course, here on the Good Morning Portugal live stream. And... Um, we will look at his most recent outing, a newsletter here, from a state of emergency to calamity. <coughs> I'm sure that's um, a kind of quite quaint translation. Um, state of calamity sounds worse than state of emergency, doesn't it? And, and where to get reusable masks. Uh, we have some good news to start the week. Uh, not calamitous than it would have, it would appear. Portugal has recorded its smallest increase in cases. Isn't that great? 163 since March 14th. In percentage terms, it's the lowest since the outbreak began. I have to stress again that figures from a single day don't mean too much. So let's hope these numbers stay low, uh, says George. The uh, number of new cases on Saturday and Sunday, uh, 643, 750 respectively. H slightly higher than throughout the week, but new deaths were lower. 26 and 23. So confirmed cases in Portugal, 163 new, as we said there. Total of 24,027. This was as of yesterday. Percentage increase, 0.68. Deaths, 25 new deaths, sadly, 928 altogether. 
And the percentage increase there, 2.77%. And people recover. The new figure in George's infographic here, 1,357 people recovered. And they're very tight and um, stringent with the uh, recovery protocol. So that's the good news, uh, 1,357. And I'll just tell you a little bit more about this uh, before we go into immunity, before we welcome Will on. Uh, the emergency to calamity situation. The Portuguese government is considering taking us from a state of emergency into a calamity situation. <laughs> Um, Observador reports the third state of emergency period ends at midnight on Saturday, but we're still waiting to see what comes next. Prime Minister Antonio Costa previously said he hoped this would be the last such period. On Monday, he suggested dropping the alert down from emergency to calamity. Uh, Publico reported the PM said it was fundamental, in quotes, for people to have easy access to non-surgical masks and other protective equipment for the country's gradual reopening to go ahead in May. Above all, he said he trusted the Portuguese and you guys too, adds George, to continue their exemplary behaviour with respect to social distancing. We're all Portuguese in this, remember, uh, because the, um, the the the. The bosom, the Portuguese bosom has exp has been extended to all those resident in Portugal, whether they are native Portuguese or not in this time of emergency, remember, which I think is very lovely. Uh, Costa, again, reminds people that the end of the state of emergency won't mean the end of confinement. He says the government is prepared to take steps back if the slow exit from confinement starts to go badly. Uh, confused? I know I was, says George. Uh, Diario de Noticias uh, explains things pretty well here. Basically, outside of the state of emergency, there are three levels of exception. The state of alert, which was introduced in March, is the lowest. Calamity is the highest and contingency sits in the middle. They all give government slightly different levels of powers to do things it normally wouldn't be able to do, but they don't define the specific measures that are put in place. For example, the PM noted that a large part of the measures currently in place were introduced before the state of emergency was announced. The article notes that President Marcelo Rebelo de Souza will make a final decision about the state of emergency after a meeting with politicians and epidemiologists on Tuesday. The PM will announce a kind of calendar for reopening on Thursday, so stay tuned. So there you go. It's, it's not that clear, is it? But I mean, suffice to say, um, we are not suddenly just throwing the doors open to all establishments and our old way of life. Uh, it's going to be paced and it's going to be measured and uh, it's going to be done, I'm sure, in, in the spirit that it has been done in already with great consideration and um, cooperation. And we'll see. It's day by day. Uh, reusable masks coming to Continent and Wells this week. We already know that the government is recommending we wear non-surgical masks uh, as an additional safety measure to protect others while shopping or on public transport. But that's easier said than done if you can't find a mask. Estamparia, Aldeberto, Citiave and the universities of Lisbon and Mignot have combined to create a reusable mask they're calling Moxad Tech. That trips off the tongue. Selling for 10 euros. Look at that. It makes you look like an anarchist rioter when you're just going out to do a bit of shopping. Uh, Diario de Noticias reports that it's available now online and will be in Continent and Wells pharmacies this week. The company claims the masks have antimicrobial characteristics, characteristics, characteristics with proven e efficacy against viruses and bacteria, but it's still being tested against COVID-19. So take care. Look at that. That's a terrifying picture. No disrespect to that uh, young lady there, but there you go. And the researchers working on Bluetooth COVID-19 tracking out for Portugal. Great newsletter, in brief news, and of course, George is on a lighter note um, and uh, something celebrating World Dance Day, uh, which probably could all do with a lot more of that in the world right now. So uh, yes, check out George's fabulous newsletter, the coronavirus in Portugal for Estrangeros, uh, which you go to georgebranco.substack.com or just, just send me a message and I'll, I'll connect you to George. Rightio, uh, Will Thompson waiting in the wings. And, and before we go to... Um, actually, no, let's, let's say good morning to uh, Will now. Is it raining there, Will? No, no. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh... I'll turn it down. Right, right. How are you this morning, sir? I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm alright. I'm all right. Good. It's not raining, uh, raining. Okay, it's kind of nice, nice. Good, excellent. Glad to hear it, and I'm glad to hear you're wellish by the sound of it. And uh, your okay, epi okay. epidemiological super sleuthing continues, and has taken—I uh, can see—some quite 
big twists and turns in the last few days, which I'm sure you'll bring us up to date with. We also need executive production from the audience. So if you've got any echoes or anything like that, if the sound quality is difficult, do let me know and I'll do what I can to adjust I'm, that. I'm, I'm getting I'm feedback. Getting feedback. All right. What I'll do is when I'm when you're when you're talking, Will, I will mute my mic and vice versa. So there'll be a little bit of delay on that, but I'm sure that will help. So let me just say a few hellos to people and find out what they're doing in terms of immunity. In fact, let's go to that dictionary definition of immunity, which I think is quite useful. And I might obviously be criticised for going to the wrong dictionary. You know how these things are. But definition of immunity on your screen there: the quality or state of being immune, especially a condition of being able to resist a particular disease, especially through preventing development of a pathogenic microorganism or by counteracting the effects of its products. So you get the gist there of what we're talking about this morning. And it's not talked about much. Let's face it, you know, there's, we're all about the, you know, prevention in terms of, you know, fearing the enemy. And it's, there's a lot of uh, combat-like vocabulary in use, you know, fighting the enemy but not so much about what we can do with our own sort of sovereign superpower of building immunity in ourselves, and that's what we're talking about this morning. So on that uh, basis, vitamin C, tons of garlic, daily work in the garden and grounds, vegan diet for Eloise. Bridget Mapley is currently in Cambridge, UK, moving to central Portugal in September. Fingers crossed. We have our fingers crossed for you as well. Gary is tuned in. Neil is tuned in. A mask emoticon proudly displayed there. Uh, good morning, Carl and all from Stephanie. Good morning from Julie Marsh from Sunny Fundal. Sunny there. Uh, good morning to you, uh, Gary. And thank you, Chantel, for your uh, production assistance there. I'll, th I'll mute my mic up and let uh, Will do a little bit of an intro to what's on his mind at the moment. And I'll find those graphs for you that you want me to share, Will. Over to you, my friend. Well, first, I guess I would say I'm really happy that the news you just said about masks, they're, they're now saying if we're going back out, we're going to have to find masks. Um, and he said non-surgical masks, didn't he? Which is basically find your own, make your own and so on. Um, I just wish when they say things like microbial properties, antimicrobial properties, they'd tell us what it actually is. What are they doing? Putting colloidal silver in there? Putting disinfectant in there? Um, sort of, yeah. It, it, again, it's about giving more information so that people know better. Um, things like with the vitamin C thing now. Uh, most people just know that you take it and it's supposed to be good for you, but you don't really know the details of what's going on. And I was frustrated because the, the, the health advisors, and certainly on the media, were saying we don't really know. We don't have any proof that it might help. But when you go into the details in the background, it's all clearly explained about how important um, the vitamin C is. Uh, so I've been just on and on about the immune system for a week or two now. And I reached a level of conspiracy. I was getting so mad with, you know, it not being discussed or used that I started going into my own conspiracy saying, maybe this is on purpose. Are they trying to, you know, keep us sick? But I've calmed down now again. Um, so I'm going to talk about the white cells first of all, your innate immune system. They are clever little things. And there's a whole bunch of them doing all different jobs. But the, when the virus infects your body, uh, it goes into some of the cells. And your white cells, the T cells, are roaming around like little animals. And if they detect damage in a cell, they can't see the virus yet. But if they know the cells being damaged, they use the vitamin C and they turn it into hydrogen peroxide and inject your cell, your own cell, and explode that cell before the virus can replicate. So they need the vitamin C to do that. So suggesting it's not necessary when it's crucial, just is, you know, it's not right. And someone who's fairly healthy, they've had a good diet before they get infected. If they did get infected, they would already have a nice, healthy white cell count and the white cells are already stoked up with the, the stuff that they need. Um, this goes on to the lack of antibody. You know how people are really worried about why some people aren't developing antibodies. And my suspicion now is because this disease mostly comes in on the lung side. It's still on the air side of your lungs and your blood. And most of your defense appears to be the T cells, which come swimming along and they notice the cells infected. So they, blow it up and it stops the virus from moving on but they have very little chance to actually meet the actual virus they don't get a chance to actually wrap around it and uh, to make antibodies 
So white blood cells have to wrap around it, tear it to pieces, and then they hand it to other cells who then start figuring out what code it is so they can then put a marker on other viruses. And from then on, you've got immunity because the white cells next time, they come along and they see the markers on the virus themselves. And that's why when you have immunity and antibodies, it's your your body is defending against the virus rather than just having to blow up little bits of, of your cells to protect you. Um, and now they're, they're saying, yes, people who are infected for longer do have higher antibodies. Any questions? <laughs> Uh, just just swapping the mics over there to, to reduce on the feedback. Uh, you make it sound so exciting. And um, this is a sort of narrative of, you know, this battle going on inside the body and these forces for good inside us doing this these jobs are kind of like an occult hidden thing, aren't they? We don't, it's not talked about. And it's such an exciting thing. It's like, you know, the kid in me is, is seeing the, the you know, comic book potential of this battle going on inside of the forces of good over evil. And it is a great narrative. It's one worth sharing and talking about and then looking at the specifics, like you say, of how we do that. You know, yes, vitamin C is good. Turmeric might be good. Garlic might be good. Silver might be good. But we need to know more, so we need to know how much. And I, I get a bit conspiratorial like you. Why are we not hearing so much about that? I guess it's this old newspaper adage, isn't it? It's like, you know, good news is still doing up its shoelaces while bad news has gone twice around the planet. Well, it's a bit sad that people who are fairly aware of themselves about being healthy and so on will probably already have a really good diet and take vitamins and so on. Um, my concern is for a lot of people who don't have that sort of level of concern for health and so on. A lot of families who they're not going to go into the public health advice England and read up, you know, read the updates every week. They're waiting for the television to tell them what to do. Um, so, so true that. Well, and I saw a BBC report last night. It was a doctor talking about how obesity seems to be um, a big factor now. You know, we, you, you see these various trends of, you know, wow, smokers seem to fare better. And then, you know, different conditions, different lifestyles have different effects. You know, uh, darker skinned people, for example. And then the obesity thing out of nowhere last night I saw on TV, 50% of people's diets in the UK now are made of, I think he called them hyper... Um, not produced, but, you know, um, uh, not, not natural, not, not food made from scratch, but, you know, like mass-produced foods, factory foods. 50% of people's diets in the UK is made of that stuff. It's lifeless. It's just, it's just filler and fodder, and it's a lot of sugar and fat to make it tasty to people, and it's even worse in hospitals. Apparently 70% of what you can buy in hospitals is mass-produced rubbish. It's of no nutritional value. And, you know, there was a time, wasn't there, when, you know, people... When, when, when the government put stuff to fortify flour, for example, that might still go on, riboflavin, whatever, or in cereals, that it has disappeared, right? Microphone back on to you, mate. Um, the obesity thing. Uh, again, it goes back to the, the battle that's going on between your white blood cells um, and this virus that's invading. And it very much seems to be a case of if your system is topped up and fast and ready to go, it gets on top and beats the virus back before it has a chance to replicate. But any factor in that battle that forces it to take longer, it's got to, you know, it's struggling to get the right minerals and so on. Um, the, the slower your response is, and then the more chance the virus has of getting out of control. Two of the things are how fast the white cells can move. They float around or they actually physically go around looking for sensors and chemicals to can tell them where there's a problem. If you've got a lot of sugar in your diet and you're dehydrated, it's all sticky for them. And it's really, they're moving really, really, really slowly. And the chemicals that are moving around that they're tracking, it's also really hard for them to move around. So if you've got, you know, a health, low blood sugar and well hydrated, then they can just nip around a lot faster and get on the, get on the fight. So it is, at this point, it is very important to have, start avoiding lots of sugar for sure and drinking a good, you know, six cups of water a day or so. Excellent. Okay. And, you know, I, I recognize you're, you're not a sort of medical doctor or would claim to be a, an expert in uh, nutrition, you know, in, in terms of a professional medically trained person. But I think we should scratch the surface with that caveat and, and create a little bit of a list here. So, you know, certainly there is talk now, isn't there, of vitamin C, vitamin D, the sunshine vitamin, uh, zinc. 
and you know these other things the turmeric the garlic the colloidal silver can you talk a little bit more about those and the balance you've mentioned water there you mentioned um reducing sugar anything else we should be looking out for those other ones you mentioned um all i've not looked that much into them because they seem to focus more on bacterial problems um but none of them you know they all seem to be you know i would play it safe and say have a little bit of all of them because all of them sound like they, they, they help um there's things like selenium definitely helps when okay so i'm not a doctor but i grew up with my mom having a blood deficiency she uh platelet deficiency it was hard for her to clot her blood um and she was a terrible eater she'd always be feeling sick and tired and she wouldn't eat and i'm like mom you've got to eat something or oh, i'll just have a biscuit I'm like no you're gonna eat <laughs> and then with leukemia on top of that um and really struggling with both those things together, I've spent a lot of my life looking into immunity and blood and, and nutrition. And over these last three or four weeks, it's like being a crash course in understanding and learning all that stuff, which if you think about it, isn't that different to what doctors and nurses do anyway, just studying, you know? My fear is the doctors and nurses on the front line don't really have time to sit and fully investigate the specifics of this disease so much. They're too busy learning about the what do you call it, the protocols and the things they're told that they're supposed to do in certain situations. And my concern is that sort of good information isn't coming down from the top fast enough. Um, I'm, I, it's really sad to hear. There's not many stories getting out from the nurses and doctors. They've, they've been told to, you know, not whistleblow or speak about how bad it is. And that concerns me, that level of hush, hush. Um, but I'm hearing some harrowing stories where even the doctors and nurses are feeling like, it's not going well in certain places. Now, you can understand that because this is a very unusual and difficult disease. It's not quite what we've seen before. Um, but when, when I've, I've seen a nurse and she's in tears and she's talking on behalf of another nurse in New York saying that they're not even giving them vitamin supplements to help at all. And that's, so why, why not, you know? Even a little bit has got to help. And then yesterday, uh, you probably heard the reports that we're hearing alarming stories that young children are starting to present with these swollen fingers and rashes. And in, have you not heard about this? The, the, it's just starting to happen in Britain now, and Italy are now reporting it. Young kids are suddenly showing up. It's still rare, but in, in uh, enough numbers to concern them. Uh, kids are showing up suddenly with swollen necks, with blotchy rashes, with fingers all swollen up. And they're, the doctors are apparently mystified as to, to what it might be. Um, and it, I just looked into it all. And anti-inflammatory, when you have good vitamin D, it's really good at regulating your response and whether it's an inflamed response to allow the white cells to get in or uh, anti-inflammatory. And if you don't have enough vitamin D, the the, the balance leans towards inflamed. And I've got a sneaking suspicion that the fact that the kids have been inside in winter all this time, normally they'd be out at school, you know, playing in the playground and stuff. Now they'd be getting even just enough to get by. And I'm concerned that kids that have been now locked at home for four months are have a f severe deficiency and that's what's causing it. And I haven't seen anything to dis dis uh, yeah, to disprove that yet, but I haven't seen a single doctor even speculate the concept. That makes a, a hell of a lot of sense, Will, and it's another one of those things, isn't it, that you know we, we couldn't have known until it kind of came upon us. Well, I mean, you know, the more visionary among us, I guess, would have seen that coming. Someone like yourself, for example, you know, you think, okay, we need vitamin D. They're not going to get vitamin D if they go and stay indoors and are locked down for months on end. And you have to have, you have, to have a plan, don't you, about what you do about that because it's all about mitigation and balance isn't it rather than just these really extreme measures but again i suppose if you don't know you can't say can you and that's that kind of points to an institutional or um hierarchical failure in really understanding what health is about and then as you say it tends to be in the balance of existing protocols rather than bringing anything new or innovative in in the crisis and of course what we haven't mentioned so far as well which is a big issue for everyone who's locked down potentially and certainly for those at the front line is stress because stress is really bad for your immune system right um there's a, there's a guy called Dr. Greer. Have you heard of him? He looks into the alien UFO phenomenon. 
Um, and he's a full on doctor, like professional doctor, but he moved towards the sort of meditative side and the consciousness and stress and so on. Um, and I saw a great thing from him yesterday. He's, he worked on this project. They did an experiment and they got something like a, it was in a, in a city of 2000 people. They put 2200, 1% of the population. They had people all meditating at the same time and being calm. And they did it as a full scientific study over and over again. And they found out that if there was 1% of the population all being calm and he calls it some kind of alignment of consciousness or something, resonance. Then the whole city started calming down. There was less crime. There was less <laughs> violence and so on. Now, <laughs> it's hard to go, oh, is that a kind of, you know, is that an actual metaphysical thing that we still don't understand? I've seen enough at, uh, stuff to say there's, that is definitely worth looking into. And what again, what harm could it do for everyone to learn to de-stress for an hour every day? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start learning how to do it now, just breathing exercises and sitting in the garden. Fantastic. I'm so glad to hear that, Will. I am so glad to hear that. And that's what I love about you is your willingness, because I can see you recoiling a little bit from, from the, the immediate response of that idea, like a lot of people do, but you still go there. And may I make recommend Insight Timer for anyone who's, who, who wants to try meditation. It's a free app. It's fantastic. There's thousands of meditations on there. But um, let's, let's kind of conclude now, if, if, if I may. Could you run through a bit of a list? Uh, anything else you want to say? I really value your, you know, your contribution here, and I, you know, really look forward to you being on the show. And I know it's only a few minutes you've got, but could you, can you kind of sort of bring things together a little bit as we conclude? I could give you a sort of snippet on a the conspiracy Donald Trump disinfectant thing. That's a bit of a juicy story. He wasn't wrong. He didn't mean disinfectant. The hydrogen peroxide I'm talking about that the, your cells. Uh, inject your white blood cells inject it's a disinfectant disinfectant just means kills infections he didn't mean bleach he'd been listening to the scientists and they were discussing a drug called chlorine dioxide which uh, is a gas which can actually kill microbes in the air and there have been studies in the past to say you put a low concentration in a classroom and it will stop the kids getting flu but in the past people have taken at home used too much gotten sick, irritated their lungs. So the FDA banned it. And now it's like, it's known to do something like that, but it's also known to cause harm. And it sounds like one of his advisors was like, maybe we should look into this stuff that disinfects that you could inhale or get inside your body. And poor Donald Trump's like, all he heard was disinfectant. <laughs> but um, that brings up that conspiracy of are the FDA deliberately not, I mean, it's, there's no research into the, the drug. They're not even going to check and see if maybe in just the right concentration it may be beneficial. At this point, we should be looking to every possibility, right? Just tiptoeing into other possibilities. Absolutely with you on that, Will. And yes, of course we should. It's like we've got time on our hands, a lot of us, and we could absolutely be looking at all these things. And you just wonder why the debate is so narrow, I guess it's a fear response, isn't it? You know, we go to what we've always known. We shrink, don't we, in fear? We don't really expand. We don't have an expansive mindset. You're a bit of an exception, aren't you, in someone who's, like, gone into overload of free and open thinking rather than shrinking down and shying away from it all. I'm trying. Um, I'm still working on this uh, anti uh, the hypertension blockers. I got knocked off course because one person told me that uh, these ARB blockers block the wrong receptor. And I've just discovered... Uh, the ACE2 receptor and ACE1 receptor are actually like a lock that go together. So if you block ACE1, it will. It will block the place where the virus gets in. They're not checking. All they're doing is hypothesizing about it. Now, we need, we need to do some tests and go, if someone had took some of that drug, would it stop? But in order to find out, you'd have to give it to people and then go deliberately try and infect them and find out if they got infected or not. So... I'm going to keep pushing that. I'm trying to get hold of journalists to, to say, how's it going? Um, but that could be a real game changer. Yeah, yeah. Will, thank you so much for joining us again. Thompson Tuesdays, I hope this will be a regular, continue to be a regular feature and you'll come back. If you want to stay in touch with Will, you can find him on Facebook. Um, he's very accessible. He's very open, very open-minded, as you can see there. And I think he's absolutely right that we should be looking at everything that could possibly help. And um, if you can help Will... Uh, connect to more open-minded journalists or whatever 
and because I know this community here, the Good Morning Portugal community, the Happy Homesteaders, we're, 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 we're I think an open-minded bunch, and uh, coming from a heart place, and just wanting you know things to be good and right for people in the world, and um, I think that's the approach we need, certainly from a medical point of view. Last word to you, Will. Uh, show us the graph for Portugal, could you? Have you got the graph for Portugal? I gave you yet. Well, I'm trying to do that. Carry on talking there for a minute. Give it, a, give it a bit of an intro, and then I will find. I'll find it again. My Facebook uh, has uh, moved on since you sent it. Yesterday's job. Yesterday's job. Uh, we're really, really getting close, close to, close to zero, again. zero again. I hope the strength is strength. Right, I'll mute my mic. I also put the one up for the UK. They're, again, they're starting to curve over. Sadly, places like Brazil and Sweden who haven't done full lockdown, they're still going up and up and up. It's it's sort of proof that the lockdown, the severe lockdown is what it takes to get... Yeah, to get low again. You see that last result? No, it's too small, but that last result at the end is really low for yesterday, wasn't it? It was only, what is that, 50, 100, 100 cases? That's great news. So that's the UK. <laughs> I've lost you. I've muted my mic there just to, to make the sound a little better for everybody. I'll step through these, these for you now. There's the United Kingdom. Okay, so, okay, so looks, looks like that's, like that's work, work, but if, if they just, they just, it's going to be a long, slow process unless they, I don't know, I don't know. I hope they make it. We're doing great. Sweden's going to have to lock down soon, I think, although they had some good results yesterday too. Spain, our neighbor, doing good. And Brazil. Not doing good. They didn't lock down, remember? Bolsonaro still thinks it's a flu, so... Yeah. Uh, right, there you go. Thanks, Will, so much uh, for being with us again this morning. And we'll speak to you again next Tuesday and stay in touch with you in the meantime. Okay, okay. Take care. Take care. And thanks, everybody. Uh, and thanks to you from the whole community here, Will. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Bye, everybody. See you tomorrow with uh, – we'll be talking to well, – actually, we're, we're, we're talking more about our partnership with Practice Portuguese because – we should. We all know this, but we should be talking more in Portuguese, right? We should be learning the language of our host country here. I'm going to make that easier for you by doing a little bit of Portuguese language and culture every day again on the Good Morning Portugal live stream. Thursday, Dr. Mick is here talking about collective trauma and the individual response, uh, you know, how we're dealing with our personal anxiety, uh, trauma response to what's going on. And it's Fungi Friday. Uh, Mrs. M mentioned uh, healing shrooms. We'll find out more about mushrooms, urban farming, regenerative agriculture, all of that on Friday in the first of four with um, uh, with uh, the guys from Shimajito in Fundal. So thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks to Will. Thanks to you all. Have a super day. Take care and bye for now.